Hey folks, how's it going? This is Rob coming to you with a breakdown on midterm exam one, Math 134, Spring 2020. Okay, so in this video, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about some of the key ideas behind the exam, I'll break down the problems for you to help you understand where you might have gone wrong. Hopefully at this point, you've gotten your exam back. If not, please see me before or after class. I have everyone's exams graded um, so you can see where you're at. Um, so this midterm uh, covered the fundamentals of limits, derivatives, um, and continuity, those kinds of concepts there. Um, it was comprised of maybe four, basically four overarching questions uh, to that end. And for this test, you're allowed to use a scientific calculator as well as a note sheet. Those looked um, pretty good this year. Um, for any information about averages and your grades or anything, see the class notes from the last class and or contact me or see me before or after class if you want to discuss where you're at. Okay, so I'm going to start with the basics. So in this, what I asked you to do is for each statement, I asked you to determine whether it's true or false. If it's true, explain why. If it's false, provide an example that shows why it's false. And fix the statement so it's true. Um, you're encouraged, as, all, as, I, as I usually do, to use graphs as part of your justification. So the first one says that if a function is continuous, then it must be differentiable. So this is a statement that we talked about in class, and this one's actually false. It's actually the other way around. Okay. Continuous functions are not always differentiable, and one person at least put this example on here. Unfortunately, some people actually uh, showed claim that this showed why it was differentiable, but actually this is an example of why it's not. Because you have a bend or a corner at 0, 0, this function, though it's continuous, it's not differentiable, okay? Because those corners make it non-differentiable. So what we should say that if a function fn is continuous is rather is differentiable then it is continuous okay so differentiable functions are continuous but continuous functions are not necessarily differentiable. So those have to be flipped around, okay? In previous years, this was actually a homework quiz question. So you can imagine how frustrated I was when people didn't get that after being on the homework quiz. But this, this semester, I did change things up. So really important to understand the nuances there. And if you are, if you are intuitive and, and had the ingenuity to come up with that bend example, know that that's actually not differentiable. And then I think that would be a really powerful, simple example to take it a step further. Okay. B, I was very lenient with how I graded B. So B says that for the limit of a function F to exist at a value A, the limits of F at A from the left and the right must exist. Very few, but some pointed out that this is, meh, this, there was room for, there was room for wiggle room here. Technically, they have to exist and be equal, okay? And so here's an example of why. Here's a function right here, okay? And so let me see if I can actually, in this function, we have this piece here, and then it picks up right here. So let's say that Let's say, I'm going to use a red marker here. Let's say this is X. Okay. So the limit as I approach, let's say actually X is not a good letter. Let's call this, I don't know, A. If I approach A from the left, we'll call this, um, let's say this is 3 and this is 0 based on how I move this around. So as I approach from the left, the limit from the left is 3 but the limit from the right is zero. So the limits both exist, but the overall limit does not exist because these limits are not equal. So I left a lot of openings because technically in this situation, the limit itself does not exist. So you can get into technicalities of saying, well, this isn't really an example because the limit never existed at the first in the first place. 
So I allowed a lot of freedom, but the point is for a limit to exist at a given value, the limits have to exist on left and right, but they also have to be equal. Okay, it's really important they're equal. If they're not, the limit does not exist as you see here, or the limit from the, so that's the limit as X approaches A from the left is three, and the limit as X approaches A from the right is zero. Okay, so those limits are not equal. They exist, but they're not equal. Okay, so on limits, Limits were a very challenging thing for us here, unfortunately, on this test. All right. So a lot of us did do very well in terms of our intuition and, and, and noting that this is the limit as X goes to three of thinking about how can we factor this, right? Thinking about how can we make this easier to digest? So knowing it's X minus seven x plus seven, x minus three, okay? And the hardest thing is that some of us got this far and they said zero over zero, so does not exist. That's not true at all. Zero over zero does not mean does not exist. If you think that at this point, you have to change that now, not good. Zero over zero does not mean does not exist. Zero over zero was specifically brought up. Please go back and look at this. This was the first day of class uh, in 2020 spring. That would be February 8th. Please look at that again because zero over zero, I explicitly said in that case, that is when you're gonna go ahead and try to simplify it and try again. So in this case, how we'd simplify it is that we would cross out this x minus three and this x minus three. Then when we do that through simplification, what it becomes is three times x plus seven. And now when we do direct substitution, what we get is three times x, three plus seven, which is three times 10, which is 30. Okay, and so therefore we can conclude that the limit as x approaches three, of 3x squared plus 12x minus 63 over x minus 3 is equal to 30. Okay, so please, 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 you have to understand. Yes, I did open up the option that the limit does not exist. So I get you saying that. But zero over zero is not what that means. Okay, it's not what that means. You have to really understand that because we need to know when a limit does and does not exist. And you have to understand when, when zero over zero is not necessarily one of those cases. To help understand that, I'm gonna actually go ahead and take a look at this one right here. So what was tragic kind of on this one was that people were coming to me during the test and saying, oh, you know, Rob, is this a mi does this mean minus two? What is this minus four? That's kind of unfortunate because we talked about in class the notation for left and right limits. So when I say the limit as X approaches A minus, this means the left limit, okay? Because if you take a look at this function, right? I've got x squared plus four, which by the way, you cannot factor, unfortunately. Um, x plus seven, x minus two. So looking at this function, when I plug in two, the bottom is equal to zero. So that's a time, so this is the other thing that I saw that was kind of frustrating on this one. What I got is people be like, oh, so two squared is four, four plus four is eight, eight over zero does not exist. Okay, kind of, but why? Why doesn't it exist? And the answer is, and the reason that it is that I put this here is to fix that. So if you think about it, as I come at this from the right, so the limit, if I come at this from the right, think about it, if I'm to the right of two, I'm bigger than two, right? three, four, five. That's what we're thinking when we're coming from the right. So we're going five, four, three, two, two and a half, two and a quarter, two and a tenth, two and a hundredth, etc. We're coming from the right and getting closer and closer, but we're bigger than two. So if we're bigger than two, X minus two is going to be greater than zero. 
So that's going to be a positive number, right? Because think about it, 3 minus 2, 2 minus 2, uh, 2, point, two and a half minus 2, 2.1 minus 2. Those are all positive numbers. Okay, you know what? I'm actually going to do this positive. Let's do positive in green because we think, we think green, we usually think positive. Okay, 2 plus 7, that's 9, right? or 9, or 10, or 11. Those are going to be positive. And any number squared is going to be 0 or positive. In this case, it's not 0. So this is going to be positive. So we're going to have a positive over a positive. So what's happening here is as we approach from the left, we're going to positive infinity because we're going up. They're going up, up, up. It's getting positive. But let's take a look at what happens on the other hand. So as we come from the right, that's actually from the left. As we come from the right, That's the right. As we come from the left, so left, we're thinking negative 1, 0, 1, 1 and a half, 1.75, 1.95, 1.99, right? We're getting closer to 2, but we're less than 2. So we're less than 2 means, well, think about it. 1 minus 2 is negative. 1 and a half minus 2 is negative. 1.85 minus 2 is negative, right? Because no matter how hard you try, you're still less than 2. So when you subtract 2 from the number, you're going to come up with a negative number. So even though when you add 7, you get a positive, and you add 4, right, you're going to get a positive, because you're dividing by a positive times a negative, which is a negative, you're going down, they're becoming negative, you're going down to negative infinity. So the fact that the limits exist, but that they're two different forms of infinity, means they're not equal, therefore the limit over all does not exist. But I'm not asking for the limit overall. I'm asking for the limit as we approach from the left. And as we just saw, the limit as we approach from the left is equal to negative infinity. And again, that's because by factoring, we can see that based on the factorization of the bottom, as we come from the left, our number is less than 2. So subtracting 2 gives me a negative. So what I end up getting is a positive times a negative. So I end up with a positive divided by a negative, which is a negative, which tells you that I'm slowly but surely going down to the negative infinity. And if you plot this on Desmos, you should see that conclusion. Okay, so no infinite limits here. That's something to think about as well. Think about that as a possibility for the future that I could ask you to do infinite limits. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to derivatives. And if you didn't understand anything from the previous ones, I am going to go ahead and ask you to look back at those. Hopefully, I'll remember to put in timestamps in the description so you can skip from problems to problems. Okay, this was really unfortunate with the limits, um, especially because state the limit definition of derivative. Um, with all due respect, I do feel that I've I, I've I've emphasized this so much in class that if I give you a note sheet, it's something that has to be on your note sheet, okay? So the limit definition of derivative is that the derivative of f is equal to the limit as h approaches zero of f of x, x plus h minus f of x over h. And if you had just put just this, this limit, that would have been fine for me. You have to know that. That's actually really, really important. And remember, we started in 9.3 by only using the limit definition because the limit definition is essentially what underlies the idea of the derivative. However, we remember got tired of it. We're like We don't want to do the limits every time. We don't want to keep doing this. So we transitioned into doing the rules, right? The, the quotient rule, the product rule, the uh, sum rule, the difference rule, the power rule, the constant rule, etc. Okay, so is, this is like fundamental stuff. We really need to know this, okay? So I'm gonna show you these two derivatives. Here, hopefully you identify that you need to do a quotient rule. So here we have high and low. So we have, um, t plus 2 d high minus high d low over low squared. 
okay? So if I do this, the derivative of 3t plus 4 is 3. The derivative of t plus 2 is 1. And that's because this would be 3. That would be 0. This would be 1. That would be 0. Okay, you can confirm that derivative. Okay, so what I should get is 3 times t plus 2 minus 1 times 3t plus 4 over t plus 2 squared. I'm going back to black at this point because this is kind of just for illustrative purposes. Okay, so I have 3t plus 6 minus 3t minus 4 over t plus 2 squared. So these cancel and I get 2 over t plus 2 squared or 2 over t squared plus 4t plus 4 if you want to expand it out. Either one of those would be fine. Okay, this is just using the quotient rule. Here, I actually saw people try to be a little bit creative, and I like that. That was cool. So here, though, reminding you, you do need the second derivative on that. But this was cool. What people actually did, I saw some people attempt to, first of all, note that this is 3v squared plus 5 times itself, right, because you're being squared. So I had some people say, hey, look, why don't I just do this? 3v squared plus 5, 3v squared plus 5. If you can do this, and you know it's 9v to the 4th, plus um, 30v squared plus 25, then you could know that you'd get 36v cubed plus 60v, and then 108v squared plus 60. You could do it like that, because these are literally equivalent expressions. Alternatively, you could use the chain rule. So bring down two. So by the way, this is just s. This is s prime. This is S double prime. So this is S prime. So you bring down, and then by the chain rule, you multiply by the derivative of the interior. So remember my really big dilemma with the chain rule, and this is even from a teaching approach, is I have to teach you that you need to apply the chain rule in these circumstances, but the challenge is, is that I'm teaching you derivatives and I'm exposing you to derivatives, but up until the time you see the chain rule, you're not used to needing to use it. And in reality, as I think I've said, you've been secretly using it the whole time because you've secretly just been multiplying by the derivative of x, which has been one, or the derivative of v, etc. So it's hard to get used to seeing the chain rule, but whenever you're looking at situations like this where you have like compositions, so it's not just v squared, it's 3v squared plus 5 squared, that's when you have to start getting ready to, to look for the chain rule. And so if this is something you're struggling with, I really recommend you seek me out or look through some of the practice that I posted on the Blackboard or see it, uh, someone in, in um, supplemental instruction or, or subject tutoring or something like that, okay? So when we do this, so I get 2 times 3v squared plus 5, and then I'm going to do the derivative. So this is 6v. Okay, so I simplify and I get 12v times 3v squared plus 5, or in other words, 36v cubed plus 60v. And we can see, right, when I do the second derivative, I'll get 108v squared, right, because this is v cubed plus 60. Okay, so you get this exact same answer either way, but we need to know how to get the second derivative. We need to know how to apply the appropriate rule, whether it be squaring it out and doing double power rule or using the appropriate chain rule. But again, these are really important ideas behind calculus that are going to continue to come up. And especially because we only meet once a week, we got to we, we can't let things go. We got to continue to hammer at this stuff. OK, so. All right. So please make sure you understood what I did. I, I did here rather. And then in a moment, I am going to move on to the next problem concerning our applications. All right, so in the application problem, we have this challenging problem. So Professor Williams B combines sugar, spice, and everything nice. All of a sudden, chemical X spills into the beaker, making chemical P. The amount in grams of chemical P, formed T minutes after the reaction begins, is given by this formula. How fast is it being formed T minutes after the reaction first began? 
everyone correctly identified that what we need is the derivative, but it, calculating it was the tricky part. So the setup looks good. I've got low in general, the setups looks good. So you just have to be really tedious with cap putting this all in. But remember, you have that note sheet. So in this, so remember what I said leading up to the test. If I give you a note sheet, okay, I'm gonna remember that when I'm making the test, right? I can't just give you stuff that you're gonna copy down off your note sheet. I don't do things like that. I gave you what I hoped would be the free 20 points that way. Okay. So I have low D high minus high D low over the bottom squared and away we go. So here, if I want to know the derivative, well, this will go to zero. So it'll be 150 E to the four T times the derivative of four T because of the chain rule here. It's going to be minus 2.5 e to the 4t times the derivative of 4t, okay? Because of, the, again, the chain rule. So what you get is 1 minus 2.5 e to the 4t. Now, the derivative here is 4. So it's going to become minus 600 e to the 4t minus high 150 minus 150 e to the 4t. Now here, this is going to be again 4, so it's going to be minus 10 e to the 4t. All over 1 minus 2.5 e to the 4t squared. Okay. All right, so now just distributing everything, what you get is you get negative 600 e to the 4t. Now here, you have to be able to do right 600 times 2.5, but you have a calculator for that, right? You get a scientific calculator. So you do 600 times 2.5, that gives you 1500, but it's plus 1500 e to the 8t because of laws of exponents, the t's add minus 1500 e to the 4t, but now it's minusing a minus, so it's actually plus because this would be minus 1500 e to the 4t but you're subtracting that. And now this one is gonna become minus 1500 E to the eight T. Okay. All over one minus 2.5 E to the four T squared. So um, in this case, you can combine your like terms, you can move that all around, but notice the one, the 1500 e to the eight, 1500 e to the eight. Okay. Those are going to have to cancel. So what I get is 900 e to the, to the four T over one minus 2.5 e to the four T squared. That is how much it's changing T minutes into the reaction. Okay. And so how much fast is being formed a minute afterwards, what I'm looking for is P of one. So if you didn't calculate P of T, that was kind of a challenge, right? So it's 900 times E to the fourth over one minus 2.5 E to the fourth squared. Okay. This is something that you would calculate in a calculator. Um, it's something that I think is, is probably pretty easily doable. Um, and if you have a scientific calculator, it's really important that you know where the how to find the button E, okay? And I, it, because um, this is gonna continue to come up, so you do really wanna make sure 
you have access to that. So if you don't know now, look on your scientific calculator, find the button E, okay? Um, I It's difficult for me to show you because I use a graphing calculator and those aren't allowed, though they are essentially like the same idea um, in terms of they can do all the same things um, or at least a graphing calculator can do everything that a scientific calculator um, can do, okay? So here the idea is one, calculating the derivative, and then two, applying the derivative, okay? And so what I got here is when I did this, so I did 900 e to the fourth over one minus two e to the fourth uh, squared, I got about 2.677, so that would be grams per minute. That's how fast it's being made, approximately at that speed, okay? And so for how many grams would be there eventually, they're saying, well, what limit is implied here? So what you're getting at is that the limit as the time goes to infinity, when you, if you ever study, um, if you ever study differential equations or dynamic systems, this is what we call a steady state solution. So in other words, if I have 150 minus 150 e to the 4t over one minus 2.5 e to the 4t, the steady state is what's happening as we get, as t gets very, very large. And so if I divide everything by e to the 4t, so that this would just become minus 150, it's become one over e to the 4t minus 150, or actually that would be not minus 150, minus 2.5. So if I take the limit as t goes to infinity of this, what happens is this goes away, this goes away, right? Because he blows it up, that makes it zero. And I get negative 150 over negative 2.5, okay? And negative 150 over 2.5 is 60. So what that means is that over time, as T gets infinitely large, the amount of grams is approaching 60, okay? And this is just an application of infinite limits. Okay, so please make sure you understood how I did this here. There was a lot of um, derivatives that needed to be done, okay? This, this tested your knowledge of quotient rule, chain rule, and rules with E, okay? So all stuff we did very much adjacent to that. And that's something I might be thinking about in the future as I tune it up, how I prioritize adjacent versus farther away content um, so that you're getting not too much stuff you just did the last week. But for here, this is times where if these are things you don't understand, right? Because my email is pretty quiet the week leading up to the test, that's a time you really want to reach out to me, okay? I promise you it will be worth it, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and move on to the last question, um, and that is writing the equation of the tangent line to the graph passed through the point 250. This turned out pretty well for a lot of people. So if I want the slope of the tangent line, the first thing I need to do is I need to calculate the derivative. So that's 3x squared plus 6x. And so at, when x is equal to 2, the tangent line at that point is equal to what I get when I plug 2 into the derivative. So that's 2, 4, 12 plus 12, which is 24. So that means the slope is 24. So if I know I'm looking for y equals mx plus b, well, I know, and I know that it's got to go through 250, then 50 equals 24 times 2 plus b. So 50 equals 48 plus b. So b equals 2. So our equation is y equals. 24x plus 2. It's got to be 24 because the derivative tells us that when x is 2, the slope of the tangent line, which is given by the derivative at 2, right, gives us 24. And then in order for it to go through a y of 50, the intercept has to be 2 so that right when we plug in 2, 50 comes out. Okay. So again, I hope this made sense. If not, I encourage you to please go back through it and make sure you understand what I did here. 
Then in a moment, I'll do my brief uh, explanation of the bonus and wrap things up. So in the bonus, what I was getting you to do is thinking about antiderivatives. So an antiderivative of a function is a function which when differentiated gives the function you started with, right? So if I want the antiderivative of f, what I'm looking for is a function g whose derivative is equal to f, right? If g prime is f, then g is the antiderivative of f. Okay, so what I'm getting at is here, give me two possible antiderivatives. And if you can do that, I gave you, I believe, two points per row, provided that you got both of them. So for example, here, when I differentiate x squared, I get 2x. So x squared is an, is an antiderivative of 2x. But let's say I drew, differentiated x squared plus 7. Well, here I'd get 2x and the seven would become a zero. So that's another antiderivative. Here, for example, you could have done um, two x cubed plus x squared or two x cubed plus x squared plus three. You could even tack on a number here, like pi, okay? Finally, this one was a tricky one. So here you would need a quarter x fourth. So the this would cancel out and then you drop down to a three. And then here, you need one half e to the two x so that when you do the chain rule and you multiply by two, right? Cause you have to do it's e to the two x times the derivative, right? Then what happens is the half cancels out the two from doing the chain rule, okay? Finally, here you could just tack on basically anything you wanted plus pi. Cause when you differentiate pi, it's a constant and you get zero. Okay, so this is my breakdown of midterm one. I hope you found this to be helpful in terms of filling in some of the gaps you might have. This stuff, I'm gonna tell you straight up, will come back throughout the semester. It will come back conceptually as we talk about content that relates to it, and it will come back on the final for sure, in some way, shape, or form. Okay, so please keep the questions coming. Remember, you can always send me work um, and questions at robert.morayy at umb.edu. Send me those questions, including your work. Get as detailed as possible so I can assist you. And remember, don't give up. And remember, you can do it. Okay, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Have a wonderful day. And don't forget to love math.